So Journey is a thing. No, not the band, although they are pretty stellar. The game, from that game company? No, that's seriously the name of the company. Okay, you know what? This is not my strongest opening, so there's a game called Journey from a company called That Game Company. Everybody on the same page? Okay. Journey is a game that really stuck with me, the way only a few games ever do. But I think this game did that for a lot of people, and for a long time, as it's still incredibly popular. It has a lot of charm and loads of atmosphere. There's also a sense of mystery, and it's just stunning. Look at this! STUNNING! I often recall my first time playing through this game, and I'm very quick to recommend it to others, but I can't really pinpoint one single explanation for why. I usually fall back on saying, it's just something I really recommend you experience. In a way, you might say that this game has haunted me, but like, in the serene memory of a truly wonderful experience kind of way, and not the scary ghost British children singing nursery rhymes kind of way. Come and play with us, Daddy. I hear similar things from many of my friends and other gamers who've played it. Everyone often cites Journey as an exemplary game and a wonderful experience, even if it's not a daily go-to. But why is this? What makes this experience so unforgettable? The graphics certainly hold up. I played it on PS4 for this footage, and despite being a bit more cartoony than modern graphics, they're still beautifully immersive and highly evocative. The soundtrack is minimalistic in orchestration, and yet it's lush, thematic, and instantly recognizable. The story is simple, and it's told without any dialogue, yet fills the world with wonder. The gameplay isn't really innovative, as it's an adventure platformer, but the controls are tight and fun and very intuitive. All of these things are great, but I think it's the combination that sets Journey apart. The way all of these parts come together create the perfect alchemy of game design. And it's this perfect incandescent interstices that really emphasizes what games can be and that they are an art form. And I'm not going to get all high and mighty and say that Journey is a game that is art and other games are not, because that's besides the point. All games are art. But Journey does make a great case study, especially in how games are unique as an art form, and how some games push the limits of what is possible and even elevate other kinds of art. By examining how we understand art and its aesthetics, the design of video games, and the inclusion and understanding of the Ludo narrative, as well as how co-op can influence how we feel about a game, this game proves that all games are art, and they might just be one of the greatest kind of art forms humankind has ever created. And so today, I want to talk about Journey. The creation of Journey is strongly connected with the inception of that game company, and particularly their design philosophy. Before the company was founded, two of its members created a short demo called Cloud, with the intention of focusing on conveying a feeling through the game, rather than on traditional player goals. Cloud was received positively, and so that game company formed around this emotion ethos. They were quickly given a contract to develop three games for Sony's new online distribution system, the PlayStation Store. Journey was the last of these three games, following Flow and Flower. It was also the largest and most ambitious of the trilogy. The studio grew from around 7 employees to just under 20, and instead of taking the estimated one year of development, it took three. Finally, in 2012, Journey was released to critical and commercial success. The game received high scores from gaming periodicals all over the world and was praised for its visuals, music, and unique take on cooperative play. Austin Wintory's... Austin Wintory's... I don't know how to say his name, but his soundtrack marked the first ever video game to be nominated for a Grammy Award in 2013. And while award shows largely suck, it did mean that the crotchety old white people of the music industry were beginning to see video games as art. Since Journey's release, that game company had been diligently working on a follow-up and recently released Sky, which I haven't played but looks really cool and I think follows in that evocative emotional philosophy. It's hard to spoil a game like this because talking about the plot is really besides the point, and this is only my interpretation of the story because it's a bit cryptic. But if you really want to go in blind, and you should, this is your spoiler warning. You play as this weird looking scarfed... person? And in the distance looms a large mountain, and like I said in my Breath of the Wild video... Of course you're gonna try to climb it! Why wouldn't you? So you set out on your journey... Oh, I get it! Do some platforming, solve some puzzles, outrun some monsters, and learn the truth about the other scarf people and scarf creatures. Long ago, some people settled the land and found the magic and power in scarves, or banners, or whatever they are. The people harnessed this magic as an energy source to power great cities and technological wonders. But of course, this amount of power caused strife between the people, and they argued over who controlled the scarves and their power. So the ancient people began to build autonomous weapons meant to destroy each other and hoard the scarves. But this war led 
to the extinction of these people. Over time, their great cities were left to ruin and the desert slowly crept in. And now their collective consciousness has created you as their last hope of redemption. And you have to reach the summit of the mountain in order to... save everyone? I don't know. But the game ends and the implication is that the cycle starts over. Yeah, so the story is a bit unclear, but that's a good thing, and in fact, part of the point. If you've seen any of my older videos, then you know I like to go on about how there's no such thing as bad art. The purpose of art is simply to experience something. Whether that experience makes you feel good, or bad, or sad, or angry, or uncomfortable is all relevant, and all part of the experience of the interaction between audience and art. The design philosophy of that game company allows them to achieve this, perhaps more potently than other game developers, because their intention was the experience and emotion, rather than the go here and get the thing, or grind for bigger numbers so you can go here and get the thing. Not that those are bad game design ideas, they certainly work on me, and when done well are responsible for some of my favorite games, but the subjective nature of Journey's story does force you to interpret the events presented in the visuals. And this brings us to one way in which video games are a synthesis of many art forms. It's like a breakfast cereal, with the crunchy wheat bits, and the multicolored marshmallows, and some sprinkles, and dried fruit bits, but not raisins. Never raisins. What was I doing? Oh right, an analogy. Video games are like cereal in that they are one cohesive thing, but made up of many different bits of other pieces. They have the capacity to give you everything you want in one bite, but unlike cereal, you have less of a chance of getting diabetes. Anyone familiar with the music industry, or possibly history in general, has probably heard of the romance era's biggest asshole, a man by the name of Richard Wagner. Apart from his terrible personality and life choices, whoa, just look at that neck beard. He did have some truly great ideas, some of which we still use today and are integral to music composition. A leitmotif, or idée fixe if you're French and hate Wagner, is a small musical theme, usually only a couple of notes long, that is representative of a character or theme. One of his most self-aggrandizing ideas was the Ring Cycle. The goal was to tell this epic tale over the course of four nights through the use of what Wagner considered the highest form of art, opera. No accounting for taste. He considered opera the best because it was the intersection of all other important art forms, according to him. This included dance, musical performance, poetry, prose, lyrics, storytelling, acting, drama, vocal performance, composition, set design, painting, costume design, and so on and so on. I'm just going to preemptively apologize to all my German-speaking friends for this, but he called this great artistic endeavor the Gesundkunstwerk, which translated into English is the total artwork. How come you can just jam words together in German, but not in English? But this Gesundkunstwerk is what Wagner wanted to subject or present to audiences for upwards of three hours per night for four nights, as if he already didn't have his head so far up his own ass. And if you're lucky enough, or unlucky, depending on how you flip the pancake, you can still go see this whole thing done every 10 years or so. It's a big deal and it's hugely expensive, but people flock to it for some reason. But what does this have to do with Journey? Well, I think that video games have the potential to be the Kazumkunstwerk, but for the modern age. The reason, I think, is self-evident. It's pretty obvious that games are built on the foundations of other forms of storytelling. Dialogue, voice acting, visual art, music of various kinds, sound design, character animation, location design, flavor text are all part of what goes into a game. But why use Journey as the example? It doesn't have any dialogue or voice acting, so how can it be an amalgamation of all art? That is very true, but art is subjective, and Journey also has large sections of its game that utilize the use of motion in a unique way that is very dance-like. Most other games tend to treat movement as utilitarian. It's just a means of traversal, and certainly character animation is part of art, but I'm trying to draw attention to the beauty inherent in the movement in Journey, and how that's different from how a lot of other games present travel. Some first-person shooters don't even give you legs, and I'm not saying that this lack of dialogue or interesting movement makes Journey better, but it's a unique choice for how to tell a story, and Journey winds up having to fall back on the elements of visual art to convey its narrative. You know, things like motion, lighting, color, texture, positioning, contrast, environmental storytelling, or the basic principles of visual composition. Because it doesn't use dialogue, the narrative isn't particularly in-depth and there's not a lot of drama or character arcs, but this does mean that part of it is left up to interpretation, and that's kind of fun in its own way. Like any creative process, the understanding and use of good craft while in the act of creating can lead to great works, and games rely on good execution of all the parts to come together and create a brand new experience that is more than the sum of its parts. And Journey does this one particular way, and other games may do this with more emphasis on dialogue and excellent storytelling, but the point is, is that you can select Select the art forms you want to use and create something wholly unique when they're put together.
Movies already do this kind of amalgamation that games do, and they've been around a lot longer. They have a rich tradition in their own language or shorthand. Can we really say that video games are more than movies? This is a complicated question. Movies are great and continue to be their own amazing art form, but I would actually say that the more games try to become movies, the more they lose out on what makes them so special. Games are different from movies, not better, and they have something unique that sets them apart. But let me backtrack for a minute. Like video games now, when the moving picture came out, there was a lot of controversy about whether they were art. Critics mocked it as a fad that was all spectacle and no substance. And a few decades later, people did the same thing with talkies. People went fucking nuts arguing that silent films were the real art form. This kind of reminds me of the same cultural debate we're having about the rather pejoratively named walking simulators. I think that these are games, and it has to do with the fact that they have something in them that movies don't. In English, we associate the word game with play, and this automatically implies a sense of fun. Many people do not get this sense of fun from so-called walking simulators, but that's besides the point. Asking if a game is fun is a bit reductive. As I stated, art is about the experience, but unlike movies where the experience is presented to the audience, video games ask the player to directly affect the experience and in turn be affected by the consequences of their actions as the experience takes them into account and presents that as a new piece of art to interact with. And just just like any other art form, when the craft is done well, it can really elevate the experience, fun or otherwise. There's a term that gets thrown around when talking about this topic called ludonarrative dissonance, which comes from ludology, or the study of games and gaming, and narrative. What it refers to is the disconnect between what a narrative of a story is telling a gamer and what the gameplay is telling the player. There are many people who argue for or against this concept, but I actually think it's besides the point. This immediate interaction with the player is called the ludic structure of a game, or what we call gameplay. These are the systems that inform the player through mechanics, and then the player can then provide their own input into. In Journey, the ludic structure of the game is one that makes movement on the ground a little dull, but movement in the air very, very fun. And the gameplay loop of trying to find these little power-ups reinforces this idea because it gives you more ability to be off the ground longer. As you progress, you gain a longer scarf, which works as a visual indicator for how long you can fly. The story tells you that scarves are a source of great power, so of course you want a longer one. That means more power for you. But at the end of the game, when you climb the mountain, the cold weather strips the scarf of its power. Getting up the mountain is physically draining. Movement looks hard and is daunting, just like it was when you were on the ground, but now it's even slower. And this is translated from your avatar to you. Your avatar moves slowly as they struggle through the deep snow. The scarf gets smaller, an indication of the loss of power, and so you move sluggishly. The uphill battle now directly affects you, the player, as well. You can't jump around and fly the way you used to because that's a waste of your precious energy that you'll need to get up the hill, but yet you still won't give up. You keep choosing to push forward on the stick. You want to get to the top as much as your scarf person does. The entirety of your ancestor's redemption lies with you. The fact that movement isn't fun anymore doesn't dissuade you. It makes you feel like you're battling the weather. The loss of power limits your avatar's ability, and this limits the types of input you have as a player. And you hope that you have enough strength to make it through. And this feels hard when all seems lost. But then, pow! You get this amazing last section where you're flying through the air and your scarf is extra long and movement is fun and freeing and just wow. But the gameplay in both of these moments matched what was happening to your avatar. You were invested because you felt the effects of the world through the environmental storytelling, through the visual storytelling, and through the events and gameplay. The gameplay and narrative systems were working in tandem and the hope is that the game uses this to evoke emotions. In the last couple years, a game called The Last of Us 2 came out in case you didn't hear the entirety of the internet bitch about it. But this game uses Ludo narrative in a different way. The Last of Us 2 forces its characters and by extension the player into an ill-conceived plan for revenge and explores the cycles of violence caused by this from two different perspectives. As a result, it becomes hard to like the decisions any characters make because you probably disagree with their reasons or actions. But the game forces you to watch and experience the outcome. So you either play through the events and feel awful at what you're being asked to do by the game, or you stop playing. The former is perhaps the intended experience, but the choice to not play is just as valid. If the intention of the game was to evoke bad feelings, then not wanting to experience them is a valid interpretation of the art. Whether or not this works for the player is subjective. That's the hazard of any art form. Is it fun? Fuck no. But it's not supposed to be, and you don't have to keep playing. 
But if games are art, and they are, then you do have to realize that all parts and kinds of art are valid. Do I think that The Last of Us 2 will be remembered as an important game? Well, only time will tell, but it continues to be a talking point because of its ludonarrative choices, so perhaps it will be remembered as a divisive piece of art, but not in fact played as a piece of art. The way that the gameplay and narrative affect the player makes games more than just any other kind of visual art form like movies or television. No other art form brings the audience into the creation of the experience as gameplay does, and possibly even VR in the future. Because everyone's experience with that interaction is unique, and the decisions you make and how you play create an experience that is not just a unique interpretation, but a unique adventure. And that can be super fun to compare, because half the fun is seeing how your adventure differed from another person's. Journey is really excellent at making you feel a whole gambit of different emotions. In some moments you might feel joy, hope, awe, or wonder, but it's also really excellent at making you feel small and alone as you go through this adventure. But sometimes, if you're online, and if you're lucky, you might just be graced by the presence of another person. And this is how I think the game really should be enjoyed, because it feels much more powerful when you experience these lows and highs when there's another person there with you. You feel a little less lonely and tiny in the vastness, and you feel accomplished and joyful and a bit of camaraderie when you hit those highs, because you were aided, in some small way, by another person who was out there. And the whole time you never said a word to each other. Journey does not give you any way of talking to your partner, and it's not until the end you get to see any kind of gamer tag. The only thing the game lets you do is make this chirping sound. This little ping of sound and color is the only way you and your partner have of communicating. You essentially experience the game alone, except when you hear that chirp back or solve a puzzle together. Somewhere out there is some stranger in the world who is doing all this with you. Suddenly, the puzzles you solve and dangers you face, you did as a team. The adventure and journey is a lonely one, but with a partner, it's a little less lonely. Even though you can't talk, that little chirp tells you someone is there, right there with you, communicating. In some small way, they are urging you on. And maybe you didn't meet another person along the way. This is another aspect of Journey's minimalist design choice. The art and story feel evocative because it's not really forced on you. You don't even have to pay attention if you just want to play the game. Nothing tells you to look any more than your own curiosity, and this is the same for multiplayer. No one is telling you that you have to play with another person or that there will even be other people in the game. Lots of games have multiplayer options, and the game is still unique for each player, and of course the purpose of the multiplayer varies depending on the goals of that game. But in Journey, the goal was still emotion, and so the communicative properties of the game are extremely minimalist. They could have included cues or pointers, like in Portal, but instead the austere communication makes the interaction feel that much more fleeting, and as a result the connection feels that much more powerful. Games are art. They are as varied as any other type of art in any style, genre, or approach, but they are still art. They are a new form of art, brought about by the intersection of various crafts and other art forms that coalesce into something new. They are unique in their ability to make a player feel the effects of the narrative through their gameplay. This can be the struggles or joys of their own avatar, or perhaps the gameplay might be in opposition to the narrative. This is just as valid if the goal of the game is to disorient or cause the player discomfort. Or players, because some games are cooperative and interactive without sacrificing the unique experience of each individual player. And whether this is your first or tenth playthrough, by yourself or with others, even ten years later, this game is amazing and stands as a pillar of what games are capable of. And that is why Journey and games as a whole are undeniably art and make me very excited to see what will come about in the future. Here are my stray thoughts. Special thanks to Agnew Rogue, Lurmad19, and Dr. Leatherface. I don't know who you are, but you're out there, and you made this time through Journey a wonderful experience, so thank you. The soundtrack to this game is so good, I actually write a lot of episodes of This Is A Thing while listening to it. I also poke some fun at the expense of opera, and while I'm not a huge fan of Wagnerian opera, there are some operas that I really do enjoy, including the one I showed on screen called La Serva Padrona, as well as Bugs Bunny because that's a classic, and is also actually the ring cycle. Sand surfing and flying feel so seamless and make movement a joy. I feel like someone better at color theory should look at how the blues and greens make you feel like you're underwater and are contrasted with these blinding reds, bleak browns, and desolate whites from all different parts of the game. I love all the little scarf creatures. They're mysterious and somehow really, really cute. Also, SCARF WHALES! Hey! Thanks so much for watching that episode. I almost had a panic attack. I lost everything and had to do a manual backup, but everything's good now, but what a fucking roller coaster that was kind of like Journey. Oh, see what I did there? Anyway, if you enjoyed that video, go ahead and give a like and subscribe and share it around so you can do the co-op thing and compare it with your friends and their experience, along with anything else that's happening right here on Cinemasters Ultimate Timeline.